Welcome to the broadcast, my fruits. They got more tricks up their sleeve than David Copperfield, haven't they? Trixie, Trixie. But can they do Houdini and escape out of the fix they find themselves in? That's the question. Can they wriggle out of it like the slippery snakes and worms that they resemble? Well, we shall find out because Archwell have been speculating to accumulate. Have you heard the news? Yes. According to The Sun, they've been shelling out the sum of three million pounds, although this is only an estimate. Nobody really knows exactly what's been spent. But it seems that Archwell have shelled out three million pounds to buy the rights to a novel, a romance novel, a very popular novel by all accounts. Have you read it? It's called Meet Me at the Lake by Carly Fortune. Just don't slip in. Carly Fortune and they're hoping to drum up a fortune. They are speculating now. A few million could result in many, many, many millions if this project is a success. But can it be a success? Because this is Archerwell we're talking about. Everything flops, doesn't it? You know what is a success in their world? That is when they put the royal family drama and the royal family name into their gobs. With the likes of Spare, with the likes of the Netflix documentary. Huge hits, smash hits. Oh, wow, wow, whoopie doo doo congratulations. But that's not their talent, is it? Everything involving their talent, Pearl, Spotify, archetypes, that all meets a rather dodgy end, doesn't it? Or nobody watches. Like there are other goings on on Netflix, nobody watches. Well, they're hoping that people are going to be tuning into this and they're riding on the coattails of Carly Fortune to do it. Whose book, Meet Me at the Lake, sold 37,000 copies in its first week. Apparently that's good. Anyway, it went on to become a huge success. Do tell me if you've enjoyed it. I hear good things. A romantic fiction based on two people. Now get this. It's based on two people who rekindle romance in their 30s. And they describe the trauma faced by a character that lost a parent in a car crash. Ring any bells? As a child. Lost a parent in a car crash as a child. It covers themes that we all know and love so very well from Spare, such as alcohol and substances, the abuse of those things, mental health, postnatal depression, and guess where it's based? Guess where the scene is set? Toronto. <laughs> yeah, Toronto, my dears. You couldn't make it up. And there's going to be a few steamy scenes as well, if it follows on from the novel. Fifty Shades of Harkles. <laughs> the mind boggles. It is a make or break moment. Many in the industry have come forward to say that they don't understand why Archwell were given the rights to this for what is rumoured to be around £3 million because it could have gone for a lot more. It's a popular novel and producers would have been falling over themselves to get the rights. Why was it granted to Archiewell? We will look at that in a moment, but Archiewell do not have the experience to make a success of this kind of popular novel. Maybe under the auspices of Ari Emanuel and William Morris Endeavour, they're taking better advice to come out with something that appears more quality. But William Morris and Dever aren't supposed to be working in tandem with Archiewell, only Megan. So how will their involvement and their mentorship help with this scheme? Because what we've been told is that a return to front of camera for the Duchess of Sussex is ruled out and that she is taking a, a role behind the scenes as an executive, the executive that she is. But it did cross my mind, I must confess, if she might be cast herself in the role. A 30-something thing, some sprightly so-called ingenue, 10 years past her sell-by date, trotting around Toronto, looking for romance with a traumatized young man, fragile, vulnerable. <laughs> Perhaps my imagination is getting carried away with them myself we shall see but wouldn't that be something if starring Megan Sussex and a new billing who knows she might rope Harry into play himself as well although I doubt it even she knows that there are limits to what can be put on a huge screen that size and get away with it Prince Harry isn't one of those things one of those faces 
This new brand of theirs is supposed to be a move away from their victimhood narrative. They shouldn't be wallowing in it. So I do not understand why this particular story has been chosen. But then one starts joining the dots, doesn't one? And who released this book? Random Penguins. Who released Spare? Random Penguins. When birds of a feather flock together, even if they are penguins, you come up with all kinds of huddles behind the scene, don't you? All kinds of huddles. Could there be some sort of connection to Carly Fortune? And Carly Fortune looks like a very nice gal. I am certainly not demonising her for choosing to accept the offer from Archuel. She sounds like a very nice gal. But are there connections to Meghan Markle with this Canadian journalist? The two main characters in this novel are called, wait for it, <laughs> well, the female lead goes under the name of Fern. Fern Brookbanks. <laughs> Brookbanks. Well, of course, if you take the last letter, the last S, and place it in the middle, you get Brooksbank. Brooksbank, does that ring any bells, any royal bells? Yes. Our dear old friend, Jackie Brooksbank, husband of Her Royal Highness Princess Eugenie. Yes. From Brookbanks to Brooksbank. Quite the quiz, quite the anagram. Is, is Megan setting her eyes on the fern, seeing as the pearl plummeted to the bottom of the ocean, never to be retrieved again? She sees herself as the fern tree of Toronto. Well, if she is placed in that starring role, then the male lead that she will be counterparting, the male of the piece, what's his name, the character? No, not Trevor, not even Henry or Harry or Harold, but Will, yes, Will Baxter. Fern Brookbanks and Will Baxter are the names of the leads in this novel, which obviously excited something in their imagination. But production has stalled already, so we're told because of the screenwriter's strike in Hollywood, which has been going on for the past three months plus. It's stalled, so already there's some sort of spanner in the works, which is most unfortunate. But I did discover that there is a connection, however loose, between Carly Fortune, our erstwhile novel writer, and Meghan Markle. A small one, a loose connection, but a connection nevertheless. May the 19th, 2018. Carly Fortune, before her good fortune as a novel writer, wrote an article about Meghan Markle. Meghan Markle can't stop, won't stop, with the messy bun, even for her wedding. Yes, she wrote an entire article about Meghan's messy bun. <laughs> and I happened to be talking about my own messy bun recently, didn't I, in the last broadcast and Meghan's. Coincidence. Well, you need to take a view. In journalism, if you're writing these kind of pieces, I suppose it could go under the umbrella of an opinion piece. You've got to take a view, so I don't blame her for doing that. But it's interesting because the tone of the article very much implies that Meghan's arrival on the scene is a breath of fresh air for the stuffy old royal family. And that she is a refreshing change from the sort of uptight royal protocol which is an actually, it is an invention of the press that they are quite so uptight about things and that they roam around with a checklist, you know, Her Late Majesty roaming around saying, you know, ooh, no nail varnish, stockings at the right height, hair in the right place, uh, you know, nail polish the right colour, oh, messy buns, messy buns, no messy buns, you know, cross them off the list. You know, it's an invention of the press, I'm afraid, my dear. Yes, there are advisers and those to guide and offer help if you need it, but everybody has their own autonomy. Aside from simple coordination, everybody has their own autonomy. If they want to wear messy buns or tidy buns, they can 
uh, hustle whichever kind of buns they want to, my love. Well, not according to Carly Fortune, who says that in a family where even nail polish colour is dictated by strict guidelines, it's refreshing to see a royal rule breaker. And Meghan's style choices have been said to ruffle regal feathers. Unlike Kate, actually it wasn't her style that ruffled any feathers at all, my dear, it was her attitude, so shut up. Unlike Kate Middleton, who prefers a sleek chignon that's held meticulously in place with a hairnet, Meghan Markle loves a messy bun, because despite the pearl clutching over her tousled updo, Meghan continues to ignore this royal fashion don't. And if you're curious about all this talk of Catherine in a hairnet, well, yes, it's true. Look at this. Isn't it nice? I think it's wonderful to see that she employs old school techniques because they're practical and look good and look neat. And it's simply practical. And I was also very delighted to see the tradition continuing with Lady Lou over the years. And isn't it funny? This was 2018, a year before Mexit. And already these articles were pitching Catherine and Meghan against each other. This was nothing to do with palace briefings. This was nothing to do with goings on behind the palace walls. This was independent journalists pitching both of them against each other and not taking Catherine's side. I mean, the, Carly thought she wasn't nasty to Catherine here. I'm not suggesting that. She didn't do anything wrong. She's doing her job. So there's no disparagement for Carly Fortune here, but isn't it interesting? that just like most people at that time, everybody was giving Meghan the benefit of the doubt, even if this journalist wasn't based in England. That's how things were. Everybody was giving her the benefit of the doubt, wanting her to work, wanting her to succeed, suggesting that she was a great breath of fresh air for the royal family, you know, and stir up that old stagnant pond and bring a bit of new fresh life into it, my dear. Well, it turned out that the pond wasn't stagnant. It was an elegant, placid lake and it was serene. And before she came, during her stay and when she was turfed out, along with the hubby, it remained a placid, serene lake. That really speaks to me and it really speaks to everybody looking on and observing because it shows the continuity and the strength of the institution and the family. Yes, it does. But if Carly Fortune was writing from the heart from this piece, it certainly indicates where her sympathies nowadays might lie, doesn't it? And perhaps she has a soft spot for the Harkles. Perhaps she has met Megan on her travels. I'm sure there'll be all kinds of people looking researching now and digging to to see if there is some connection there but both of the Harkles make it a habit to pocket people as they go along don't they tripping through life pocketing people who might be useful to them at a later date so nothing would surprise me as they did with the Beckhams and this has been making a lot of news recently hasn't it the failed collapse of a burgeoning friendship with David and Victoria Beckham. What I will say is that I had, heard, I had heard from my own sources when it came to the likes of Victoria Beckham, for example. Victoria Beckham. I had heard from my own sources that one of the major things, and I know there's all kinds of gossip about how and why they aren't on quite such chummy terms now. One of the big factors was to do with the British sense of humour, which I'm often telling you about and often speaking to you about, because it's universally misunderstood. A self-deprecating humour is fundamental to the British sense of humour. And we happen to be speaking about it in contrast to America today, because Meghan is American. And this sort of self-deprecating humour that we have, and I'm speaking generally here, so, you don't have to get exercised about it if it doesn't apply to you or people you know. But generally speaking, Brits have a self-deprecating sense of humour. It is fundamental to our national psyche. I've spoken about it very recently. Something in that psyche comes from being a tiny island nation that ruled the largest empire the world has ever known. We speak in riddles sometimes. And there's a sort of beguiling sense to our language. And 
it's illustrated very well in the work of Oscar Wilde and his ladies and his, his women, you know. If we compliment someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that we think they're fabulous. You know, you'll often hear me saying about, oh, isn't it wonderful what they've been doing? And doesn't she look beautiful? Well, by now, you know, to read between the lines. And what I'm really saying is, isn't it trashy what they're doing? And don't they look hideous? We don't always speak as we find. It's a contradiction, though, because as you know, I am very plain speaking and I do speak as I find. But we Brits, we speak in riddles and there are sort of what I'm trying to say is there are textures and layers to our humour. I'm doing a bad job at describing it. I can't describe it. It's something that has to be experienced and understood. And I know that many of you from all over the world do get it, but the likes of Meghan don't. And she didn't get it with Victoria Beckham, who is very self-deprecating. And she's a case in point. She can poke fun at herself. She can put herself down. She can give the odd throwaway comment, the odd throwaway line. Oh, get Diana did it a lot. You know, oh, I'm a bit of an airhead like my son. She wasn't really putting herself down or even Harry. It's part of the humour. But it is very anti-American. It is, it is the antithesis of the typical, stereotypical American sense of humour or the American way. But in America, a person's truth is offered and given, freely given on the surface. Whereas in England, or at least old school England, it bubbles away and simmers under the surface a lot of the time. Can that mean that we are two-faced? Yes, sometimes it can. Sometimes it can. Sometimes two, three, four, or five-faced. More than Americans. Sometimes. But many of the misunderstandings or the slights that Meghan felt and that Harry felt, because he doesn't get it either, are down to that sense of humour. And the same thing happened within the palace. It was a clash of cultures and humours. There was also jealousy at play because the Beckhams adore Catherine and William and were cozying up to them at various events. David and Victoria are royalist at heart. They adore the royal family. The Beckham story in America, their story of success is very interesting. They've been a great success here and within Europe for many decades. But when it came to America and David Beckham arrived there largely unknown in 2007, to promote the game of soccer, as it's called overseas. To us, it's playing on football. We don't call it soccer. But in America, it's known as soccer. You know, football is absolutely massive over here. I can't stand it, but you know, it's, uh, it's our national sport. It's long associated with us, although we never seem to win, which makes me chuckle. But David Beckham is a huge star at that arena. And he has played the long game with football and Victoria Beckham has played the long game with her fashion business. That has taken some swings and roundabouts, ups and downs, very large highs. She's become a very well-respected and loved designer. And everybody laughed at her when she began out saying, oh yeah, I've got to design some clothes and you know, try and be the next Gucci. Yeah, well, she kind of had the last laugh there. She's admired the world over for uh, her goods and uh, she put her heart and soul into it. She's also taken some great big financial failings with that brand, so she understands the swings and roundabouts. David's trajectory seems to have started off simmering away and gone up and up and up, culminating in just last week in Florida with a great success by Lionel Messi, who was signed up to a United States team into Miami by David Beckham, and it was a triumph for David Beckham. And it also boosted the profile of the club. This was a crowning moment for David Beckham in America. After all those years slogging away. Because Inter Miami is co-owned by David Beckham. And when he hosted the debut game. The debut match just three years ago. It wasn't worth much. Now it is valued at $600 million. The Beckhams are known, love them or loathe them, as grafters. They graft away until they come up with the goods. They are not seen as grifters. And that is the big difference. That is the big difference between the Beckhams and the Harkles. And the Harkles don't have a focus. They have a sort of scattergun approach. Let's try this and try that and scandalise this and merch that. 
They are not focused on any specific particular form of success or any one passion or any one enterprise. Just a load of word salad about, well, we want to do good in the world. Well, don't we all, my dear? Don't we all want a wonderful world where there's no, there's no hate, no online hatred, no disparagements, no disinformation, but then they go out into the world and put out hatred and disinformation and all kinds of wickedness about other people. You know, who'd heard of Sasha Walpole a year ago? Who had ever heard the name Sasha Walpole? That name would have gone under the radar for good. It would never have even appeared on Google if you'd typed it in, Sasha Walpole. And because they decided to put that encounter, that encounter in the book, all of a sudden the young gal's life, who was working as a digger, all she wanted to do was dig dirt and get on with her day in the old dumper truck, the old tractor, not have certain things revealed about her proclivities, about what she did with Harry out in an old field behind a pub with the haystacks. She was quite happy to go to her grave without selling a story with that memory, that rather unpleasant CD memory. She was happy to go to her grave with it, but no, Harry had to open the pages on it and throw her to the wall. So they are the ones that tell the world, stop throwing Megan to the wolves, stop throwing. Well, he's happy to throw everybody to the wolves, isn't he? His family, his loved ones, even poor old innocent Sasha Walpole. Even Sasha Walpole, who had the misfortune, the deep misfortune, to experience that different sort of royal polling. The Beckhams are able to take the rough with the smooth. And Harry should be able to do this because he's had enough experience with the press. The Beckhams will be praised and criticised both, but they are able to take the mickey out themselves, but they don't take themselves too seriously. When people started calling David Beckham golden balls, Victoria said it as well in the press and had a chuckle about it. You could try that with Harry Meghan with old ginger balls. Give it a try. Jack Izzard is the CEO of Rhizome Media and he said that the Beckhams embody the American dream in a way that the Sussexes never can. The Beckhams combine clear talent and prodigious hard work. In contrast, the Sussexes exude entitlement in a very un-American way. That's the ironic thing because one of them is American. Victoria Beckham has good humour rather than a I must endure this attitude. Yes, that's exactly what they have, isn't it? Particularly Meghan. It's like, I must endure this. I'm so stoic and I'll get through. Instead of just having a good old giggle like Vicky B. People like Meghan who try to control the narrative and only present themselves in a perfect light forget the public warms to humour and the ability to show a flaw. He says that Harry uses Archie well as a personal flex as well as a fundraiser. Yeah, one always gets that impression, doesn't one? When they're going on about their good deeds and visiting certain charities and certain people, it's never really about pointing towards them as we see within royalty. It's always this lack of altruism and look what Archie well did. Look what we did. Page six also shared some gossip about Meghan's birthday, the run up to her birthday. Apparently a few days beforehand, she had a girly night out to watch Barbie. And who was she with? Portia de Rossi. Portia de Rossi and a couple of other girlfriends. Ooh, the mind boggles, my dear. I wonder what they roped her into. I don't want to think about it. Portia de Rossi and Barbie. What a combination. I told you I didn't want to go and see that movie. Harry stayed at home. Harry stayed at home with the kids and Doria, probably having another counselling session with Doria. Then after the cinema experience, Megan joined friends at the San Isidrus ranch that we've heard about before, where she accumulated a member of staff the one that writes out notes for her to bicycle shops, yes, at that ranch. And apparently she posed for photographs with a bachelorette group that happened to be in passing, posed for photos and videos. Maybe we'll see some of those emerge in the coming days.
more publicity to illustrate that she's just one of the girls. She's just one of the girls, like you peasants and paupers. Ah, who's that over there enjoying a wee dram of whiskey? It's our King Cozy Socks. Ah, ah, our precious King Cozy Socks, looking wonderful as usual at this annual Scottish event, the May Highland Games. He enjoyed traditional Highland dancing. There was a tug of war competition and the kilt that he wore was descended from the house of Stuart, the Prince Charles Edward Tartan. A green tweed jacket and matching waistcoat with a pair of thick red cosy socks. Keep your legs together, your majesty. We don't want anything slipping out. But he does, of course, have his winky protector and crook. There was also some caber tossing to be enjoyed. And I really liked the look of the king in these shaded lunettes. There is something about royalty in their shaded lunettes that is so elegant and highfalutin. I really enjoy the look. I have to say, by the way, it was radio silence for Meghan's birthday on social media from the royals. Radio silence, which is a contrast to only last year, which was still after all the miseries and everything. But it seems that Spare put the final nail in that coffin of uh, niceties. There were no happy birthday wishes. Last year there were wishes from Kensington Palace, Catherine and William, Charles and Camilla. This year, none. None. Well, I blame the royal family for that because as I've always said, they should never have got into all this birthday wishes nonsense and many happy returns. It's not royal. Aside from the king, you know, birthday wishes to our monarch, absolutely fine, but we don't need all this birthday stuff. It's as if Carol Middleton's running the whole affair with party pieces. It's just not warranted or needed. Quit it and stop it, because you end up in a pickle. This is a pity, because we all love our Danny Zuko, don't we, my dear? We all love our Danny. But if stories are to be believed, he's been fraternising with the Harkles at the Beverly Hills Hotel in Los Angeles. At the Polo Lounge, a party hosted by the hotel for Archerwell. Stay away from him. Stay away from him. We know that he's into all that weird Scientology nonsense on stilts. We know that. And it's, it ain't great. It ain't great. But we also know that he's a lovely man. He's a lovely man, is John Travolta. And just because he had that dance with Diana, it doesn't mean that he needs to be dancing with the devil. It doesn't mean that he needs to be associating with that particular side of the family because Diana would not be impressed with their behaviour. And her behaviour might not have been immaculate, but, but, would she have approved about the disgraceful way that William has been made to suffer and seen his wife being made to suffer? And uh, would she approve of the treatment that the late Philip and Elizabeth underwent at their hands and their behest? No, no, she would not. So keep your paws off of him. Keep your paws off of him. And John Travolta, wake up. Wake. What are they planning on doing? Casting him in Meet Me by the Lake? Maybe the Duchess of Sussex is wriggling up to him and saying, did you know that I will be paying, playing Eugenie Brooksbank? No, I mean, I will be playing Fern Brookbanks. I will be playing Fern Brookbanks. But they are looking for a will. They are looking for a big willy. And <laughs> I've met one or two... Danny Zuko, I mean Johnny, I've met, would you, big Johnny, you know you're a big man, would you love to play Willy to my fern tree? Yeah, when Big Willy beats the fern tree, would you like to do that? Well, you're barking up the wrong tree, my love. <laughs> you're, you're barking up the wrong tree with Mr. Travolta, or should I say Lady Travolta, because, <laughs> well, Royal lips are sealed, my dear, but you know, you're barking up the wrong tree there. Even your most wily, wily, feminine wiles aren't going to bowl that particular Zuko over, my love. Even your, even your feminine wiles, even your masculine streak, which so impresses Harry. Even that wonderfully masculine dominant streak of yours, Megan isn't quite masculine or dominant enough for Lady Travolta. So, spin off, do your little ballroom dance with your hubby, with your hubby, do your little tango or lambada or your foxtrot, whatever it is, spin each other around the floor and spin off. Spin off like a top, my dear, but stay away from our Danny Zuko, our John Travolta, because it's revolting to think that the pair of you in cahoots 
And I'm sorry to anybody today in the kingdom that had tickets for the Festival of Eventing at Gatcombe. Princess Anne's estate, a three-day event, the Festival of British Eventing. Well, it went off to a fine start and today it's cancelled. So thousands have been turned away and told to stick away. Can you believe it's because of the weather? <laughs> Our darling British weather, which has been wonderful for me. I haven't been grumbling, have you noticed? Because the last few days have been cool and wet wonderfully wet and even quite fresh wonderful temperatures for me and for recording but disastrous for anybody that loves summer and everything that's going on because it's uh, it was abandoned due to the storm antony the impact of the storm antony i haven't realized this but it's been going on but that's just typical for us <laughs> typical you know we had a month of very hot weather and all of a sudden in august you have festivals being cancelled because of stormy weather and concerns for people's safety. But earlier in the festival, the press caught sight of little Lena and Lucas Tyndall, together with Mummy Zara, enjoying ice creams. There were lots of welly boots on display. And some of the photographs actually looked autumnal, even though we're talking very early August here. They looked autumnal. They had the spades out. They were getting to work. Actually, this one was uh, little Savannah Phillips. She got stuck into the shoveling there. And here's our very lucky Lindsay. Lucky Lindsay Wallace there. The one that is romancing our very dashing and very handsome Peter Phillips. Oh, lucky, lucky Lindsay. This is an annual event at Princess Anne's Gloucestershire estate. And there was trampolining. There was bouncing balls. And there were camouflage onesies being worn by the children. Zara was thrilled with her own performance at the competition there. And here she is after her jump with her wonderful beaming smile. And the festival encompasses all kinds of activities from dressage to show jumping and all that kind of thing, my dear. But sadly, that was all abandoned today. And sadly, it's time for me to abandon you and let you get on with your day, my dear. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate your company. And I look forward to reading your juicy comments. My tip jar is in the description box below if you'd like to treat me to a Sunday slice of cake. I'll see you next time, my dears. Stay fruity and on royal duty. Toodle pip. <laughs>